Over to you, Jared. Hello, everyone. My name is Jared Jingris. I'm the managing director and, and the lead dam analyst at the analyst firm, The Real Story Group. And it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to this session called Dam and Integrations, which I know is a hot topic for all of you on the, on the line today. Uh, because everyone knows that dam in a vacuum, it does not achieve what we're trying to do. You know, dam in a vacuum is just another drop box. It's just another spot for files to the, or places that you can go upload stuff and download stuff. That, that, that doesn't really fulfill the promise of what we're all trying to achieve, which is deliver compelling experiences to people. And in order to deliver compelling experiences, dam needs to deliver assets to other systems to ultimately reach people wherever they are interacting with your brand and, and your assets, whether in person or online. And so I'm thrilled to be welcomed by a really fantastic panel today. The way we're going to run this panel is a little bit different than some of the other panels that I think you're going to see today. And we want it to be a little bit more of a conversation than a presentation. Of course, we have some slides that we're going to get through to just set up, set the stage a bit and give you a little bit of background so you know where everyone's coming from. But we're going to start by talking by having uh, Jesse from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum kick us off. Then we're going to follow up by talking, hearing from Dr. Gwen from the New York State Museum, and they're the they're the real practitioners here, right? They're the ones you know trying to figure this digital asset management thing out in the context of their of their museums every single day. And then we're going to hear commentary from a couple uh, consultants. Some really great consultants, John from Rise Time and Kara from AVP, are going to give their thoughts and, and, and kind of tell you about some of the, the best practices and lessons learned that they've seen, both by uh, working with some of the folks on the call today and, and in, in, in other client engagements as well. And then I'll serve as the moderator, but I'll also kind of inject my, my perspective, both as a consultant and analyst in, in the space as well. So I think we got you covered. We got, we're going to hit you from all different perspectives. And without further ado, let's, let's jump right into it. So I mentioned that I'm here to give the analyst, analyst perspective and uh, Real Story Group, that's what we are. We're an analyst firm. We, we spend our whole day watching marketplaces in the MarTech space. We watch about eight different marketplaces of which DAM is one of them. And what we try to do is evaluate the different software solutions that you all have available to you and evaluate them as to what they're good at and maybe more importantly, what they're not so good at, right? All with the intention to help you all find the best fit for what it is you're trying to do. And uh, we've had the privilege of working with organizations of all shapes and sizes all over the world, every single industry. But I honestly must confess, working with some the, the cultural heritage space, whether it's corporate archives or in particular museums, those are some of my favorite projects to work on. And I think that's really because I like seeing how the physical world really interacts with the digital world, you know, and, and, and so many museums have such a rich, long history with the physical space and you create some of the most compelling physical experiences in the world. And then as you are all on this different phase of your journey to the, to the digital world, I think it's fascinating to see how you try to replicate those spaces or complement those physical spaces in, in many ways. And, and I think that's the power of, of a truly con connected integrated dam um, and, and, uh, and I just love being a small part of that. So let's next turn it over to Jesse. who's gonna kind of give us some background about herself and her role at uh, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, Jesse. Well, thanks Jared and thanks for having me with, um, with all these other panelists. Um, so I'm Jesse Knight. I am the Senior Advisor for Digital Ecosystem Preservation and Discovery within the National Institute for Holocaust Documentation, which is the museum's collecting arm. So we deal primarily with the historical collection, but in my role as, um, as dam manager, I also partner um, with other offices within the museum, specifically um, our marketing uh, and communications office, which does, um, you know, creative services, um, as well as our educational arm, which runs the museum's website. Um, so the museum's primary mission is to advance and disseminate knowledge about the Holocaust and to really preserve the memory of those who suffered. 
we encourage visitors to reflect upon the moral and spiritual questions that were raised by the events of the Holocaust and, and really think about what their own responsibility is as citizens um, in a democracy. So um, just to give you uh, an understanding of kind of the scale and scope of um, the digital uh, both digitized and digitally acquired documentation that we're dealing with. We have about a million pages of um, digitized personal paper collections, um, about 90 million pages of archival material uh, that is uh, digitally acquired from other repositories around the world. Um, we have about 30,000 plus hours of oral testimonies, um, you know, 5,700 historical films, um, 17,000 objects, 1,000 recorded sound collections. All in all, it's about a terabyte of data. Um, and all of it is incredibly important to preserving uh, the memory of those who perished in the Holocaust. Uh, next slide. So I just, I wanna give you a slice of my perspective within the museum. So like I said, I, I deal in digital ecosystem, both the preservation uh, management and discovery of these assets. And um, this is, will set you up with all of the places where we need to integrate or develop integrations. Um, so we have our public facing services, that's the main museum's website, all of our mobile apps, collection search, which is the museum's online catalog as well as the need to share all of this content out with external partners, whether it's you know, for loan purposes um, to share out with researchers who are studying this history um, or with other organizations who we're partnering with um, in various capacities. Um, if we go kind of a layer down, we have our data management uh, layer, which includes our digital asset management software. Um, which we really use to house um, our, our uh, either production or access versions of our assets, um, as well as enhance uh, them with metadata. And then we have our digital preservation software, um, which we use to house our, our uh, master files. And then you can see our infrastructure services below, which uh, contains the storage tier and just you know the the number of versions that we're maintaining with our environment. And so within this framework, you know stuff needs to go in, stuff needs to come out, and there's a lot of places where we need to integrate these uh, mammoth systems. Thanks, Jesse. That's great. Um, next up, let's ask. Gwen to give us her overview. Thank you, Jared. Um, welcome everyone. I am with you today from Albany, New York, otherwise known as the unceded lands of the Mahikoniok peoples of the water that are never still, whose descendants are members and citizens of the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican nation. Um, and these lands are also ancestral to the Gayangahaga, Haudenosaunee, or Mohawk people, and many other indigenous folks who have traveled through here and have made meaningful lives here and continue to take care of this land and this water. Um, so what you're looking at is the New York State Museum. It is directly on the plaza facing the state legislative buildings. And within this building is not only the New York State Museum, but also the New York State Archives and the New York State Library. Um, and when we have a chance to work together, it's really exciting because, as you might imagine, our collections overlap and intersect in really interesting and valuable ways. The collection that I curate is the Cultural Anthropology or Ethnographic Collection, and it contains approximately 4,000 um, objects that speak to the history of indigenous peoples across what is now New York. Um, that largely consists of Haudenosaunee, um, but also Algonquian, uh, Eastern Coast Algonquian speaking peoples as well. So we have a robust contemporary native art collection, and those are some of the images from that collection that I've featured here. Um, Next slide. Yep. So we also are uh, at the foundation of our collection um, for ethnography is um, a collection of objects 
that were came into the museum circa 1850 from an American anthropologist named Lewis Henry Morgan, who would not have been able to collect these objects without the guidance and help of um, a Tonawanda Seneca family, the Parker family, um, and more specifically Ely Parker and his sibling Caroline Parker. And these objects are already available online. Um, we're at an interesting place in our institution where our different departments are working together to make our collections um, accessible online, to make more of our collections accessible. So that would include our geology department, our history department, our archaeology collections, um, some of our biological collections, so malacology, entomology, ornithology. Um, and as we go through this process of thinking about how to integrate our systems and how to make our collections online and accessible, um, I am particularly interested in how my collection, which really speaks to indigenous people's histories, can um, really express a more equitable and collaborative relationship and recognize the knowledge and authority of indigenous peoples um, speaking towards this collection and how we can uh, kind of move forward in an equitable way with that. Great, thank you, Gwen. And uh, I just wanted to pause really quick here and just remind everyone that in order to make this as valuable a conversation as we can for everyone on the line today, I encourage you, if you have questions, especially for for Jesse and Gwen, you know, start start getting those questions in via the the uh, Hublot panel right now, and, and I'll get to those as many of those as we can uh, once we once we finish up our introduction. So, start thinking about those now and, and get those entered. But next up, we want to turn it over to our our consultants and Kara from AVP. You're next. Thanks, Jared, and hi everyone. Um, wonderful to be here with you today, and I'm excited to talk about this important topic. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about AVP. So we help enterprises build impactful and sustainable digital asset management programs. And so what does that mean? Um, it means we, we really focus on the big picture. And this is where the integrations come in. As Jared said at the beginning, DAM adds value when it can deliver um, across the enterprise, across the, you know, to the public, to marketing, to partners, you know, wherever the assets are needed. Um, so that's part of the bigger picture that we try to look at when we're helping organizations um, build their dam programs. Um, but not only technology, um, so much of successful digital asset management um, is, is in the people, it's in the process and in the governance um, of all of those things. And that becomes really critical, especially when we have integrated systems and making sure that data quality is maintained and preserved across systems so that they um, communicate effectively and, and uphold you know, what they're, they're meant to be doing. Um, so that's part of what we, um, we are really uh, focused on with our clients. Um, and, and Jared, if you could go to the next slide, I'll just say a, a couple brief things, uh, a couple more things briefly. Um, but we, we do work with quite a number of collecting institutions, um, cultural heritage institutions, museums, libraries, archives, et cetera. Um, and we know that digital asset management is often at the center of those institutions' information ecosystem. So for museums in particular, um, you know, we often see an environment, a technology ecosystem that looks something like this diagram um, where we have DAM kind of in the center but it may be pulling from the digital preservation system. And that's actually what Jesse just showed. Um, we may be communicating with the archives management system. There may be a library information management system. And then of course, there's a collections information management system. And then there's the, you know, the layer of um, which could the web CMS, which could actually represent many, many things, different sites, different outlets, um, different access points. So. That's just, you know, when we think about uh, what we see when we work with a lot of organizations, there's this complex web of systems we, you know, you often find in these environments, the directionality here is really important. So is it, is, are these bi-directional relationships? Are they going one way? Or are they going the other way? And then of course, um, we're not even showing what are the relationships between these other systems themselves. So does the library communicate directly with the web CMS, the collections management system with the web CMS? How about the archives management and the digital preservation system? So once you start adding those layers, 
you can start to imagine many more lines. And of course, then you have things that are maybe integrated with DAM. Maybe you have some AI tools or things like that. So um, I think there's a lot of things to unpack in this topic, um, which I'm sure we will, but I just wanted to um, start it out by saying, uh, yeah, that DAM is a really critical piece of this ecosystem, but getting it right can be challenging and exciting. So I'd love to talk more about that. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. No, thanks, Kara. That, and, and I love this. This is a great graphic to kind of start this conversation when we when we kick this off because uh, just identifying the possibilities of integration and, and making a list of the possible systems that we could be talking about here is, is part of the challenge because I, I don't even think this is a comprehensive list here, right? We have so many other Not systems that could could be part of the equation then. And, uh, and it can be like a bit of a web at, <laughs> at the end of the day if we if we uh, really break it out to, to its fullest possibility. So thanks, Kara. Uh, John, you're up. Thanks, Jared. Yeah, my name is John Florence. I'm the dam practice manager at Rise Time. And Rise Time um, fills a kind of unique niche in the dam industry. We are not collection specialists. We're not really, um, at the the vertical of any industry that we service, our our real goal is to host and help support manage that environment uh, in which people host their digital assets, so that those experts can do what they want to do with the dam without having to worry about things like hosting, security, uh, capacity planning, monitoring, those type of things. And so we have a, a core group of network engineers, uh, mostly specialized in cloud deployment, um, along with the secondary team that I'm a part of, which is more around the functional aspects of digital asset management. So um, as being part of that functional team, a lot of what I do is working with people like yourselves about different ways to integrate, different ways that the dam fits in the ecosystem, um, trying to troubleshoot different challenges because no dam is perfect. And, you know, it seems like concepts in our industry move faster than software can keep up with. Um, but we also do things like, you know, in the context of an integration, you know, maybe we have to put on our um, information architect hat and play that role for a number of industries and and one thing i should say is we're really involved in a lot of industries across the board uh, museums uh, media and entertainment um, a handful of cpgs you know consumer products and one of the other things we try to do on the functional level is take the learnings we learn from like digital supply chain and cpg help people in the museum space with that we take concepts in preservation work with people in media entertainment. And believe me, we get a lot of valuable media, uh, video information from the me media and entertainment people that everyone seems to need today because video seems to be two steps ahead of uh, where the damn community is at any given time because it's evolving so quickly. So um, there's more information about this obviously in our exhibit, but I, you know, I invite you to ask questions that seem outside the realm of uh, the museum space because you know we really try and look at this as how do you support any given business at any given time with the tools you have at hand yeah awesome thank thanks john and, and I, I i just wanted to echo you one of the sentiments that you just had right there about learning from other industries and bringing that to the museum space you know if you, when i talk to museum folks they say oh we don't have anything in common with the cpg world but you wouldn't believe how similar like a product information management system that every cpg company is keeps is worried about that keeps them up at night is so, so similar to all of your collections management system it's just data about an object whether that's a a box of cereal or a, or a priceless artifact in the museum is it's actually not that different it's all metadata and 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 you know one of the most important integrations that we see all the time is that collections management to your dam uh, system and 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 uh just like it is in the cpg place it's your pim and your dam system so it's it's all very 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 uh linked together and there's lots of learning there so we got some questions coming in 
Um, but before we get to the questions, I, I just wanted to go back to you know that slide Kara had, where she listed out all these different different possible systems. And uh, you know, I mentioned that that might not be a comprehensive list, so I thought we might brainstorm really quickly. Are there other systems that you all are thinking about? You know, as as possibly adding that to your list. I know, uh, Jesse, you said digital preservation was like one of the, the biggest systems that you were thinking about integrating with your dam. Any, what other systems are, are high priority systems in, in your world? Anyone, you know, anyone, anyone, we can we can just make a running list here from a technology perspective. Well, for us, it's, it's you know, our digital preservation repository, um, yep. our uh, catalog, our online search catalog um, and our CMS. To add to that list, I would say um, a small but growing um, oral history collection um, mm. for, the, for the collections that I curate and other uh, museum collections here. That's great. And John and Kara, have you seen others? Like I'm thinking even like, you know, we mentioned web content management system as such a critical, you know, channel that people interact with, with, um, you know, digital assets, but I imagine like social publishing tools and marketing automation tools to help you send emails. You want to be pulling from that same repository as well. And any other kind of tools that you're thinking about? Oh, John, you're on mute, John. So I hit my button. Uh, one of the things that, that um, you mentioned is a, the learning across platform. You know, di digital preservation in the commercial world is really a problem. And you know, one of the things that pains me is there's a lot going on in that world where things are just discarded as being transactional. And, you know, I'm, I'm into mid-century modern furniture, my, my wife is, and we have a kind of running joke that nothing is worth anything unless it's over 40 years old or your parents threw it out, right? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it, it's, to me, it's interesting that, that what's a, what is this worth going into the future hasn't really sunk in even in, you know, com in the commercial world yet. And one of the nice things about work running around with this crowd, you know, with the, the museums and the cultural heritage organizations is, you know, you learn some of the language that helps you educate people on the other side as to what's important and what's not. I'd say the other, the other thing that I, I see in general, everywhere I go, is there, you know, and damn, we're just an industry of cliches, basically. I'm sure, Jared, you know that. Um, and there's always, people are always saying single source of truth. One of the things I've learned in the last couple of years is that concept just sort of has gone out the window. And I've kind of called it the more authoritative resource because in, in digital supply chain, and it doesn't matter if it's a museum, photo studio, where it is, you want to get the best information at the appropriate time. And I see a lot of people trying to jam everything into one single system and make it that one repository for particularly metadata when it, it almost cost them more trying to do that than it would to just let that metadata expose itself, capture at the right time, and for people to understand that ecosystem. Now, I'm even thinking of adding ecosystem to my title like Jesse has in hers, because <laughs> I really like that. It's a good one. All right, so a few other thoughts if I can. Yeah, add. you got more care? Yeah, please. Here your question. Well, so when we when we work with museums, we often find that the dam kind of bridges a bunch of different functions within the organization. So there's collections, but then there's um, exhibitions, there's education, and then there's of course things like marketing and outreach and development. Um, so we often see, you know, to to John's point is um, you know, where is the single source of truth? What is it the authoritative system for is often a question that's being worked out um, as the dam is, is kind of coming on board at the institution. Um, because all of the systems that are used in those different parts in those different functions of the museum are gonna become important uh, touch points for this system. So, um, you know, the education might wanna in integrate with um, their LMS, you know, or e-learning um, platforms, um, you know, the public um, side of the, ex the online exhibitions 
you know, there may be microsites. Um, so you can parse out that web CMS category into a whole bunch of things. So there may be like a bigger collection search, like what they have, um, what Desi has, but also kind of specialized um, exhibition sites. So there's, you know, and you may be integrating with various CMSs or in different ways for those things. And then of course, you know, how do we connect with, um, with the marketing folks, with the creative teams, um, with the designers, um, with, with development, you know, with, what do they need? So um, considering all of the functions of the institution and what role the dam can play is a really important starting point for answering the question of what should this integrate with across the institution? Yeah, no, this is a great list. And I, I don't even think we even captured every, all the possibilities, right? Cause I don't think we can in, in, the, in our, in our, even our list of interaction points with our our museum visitors and uh, both online and in person those are changing too every day right i mean you know even even just we we heard earlier in the day today about so much more of our um of our museum um assets are born digital right and so we have digital interactive displays that we plan on when when we go to a museum and what does that look like and where is that pulling from is that pulling from the dam or is that uh, you know, it, it, just like a, a website, or is it something completely immersive that we we don't even know about yet? And, and all this stuff is going to continue to change. So, lots more to come on that. But I wanted to switch topics just slightly a little bit here because I, I think all of you kind of brought this up is is one of the challenges with with integrations. It's not just technology. It's just not just systems in, that we're talking about here. Most of the time, you're de by definition you're dealing with another team within your organization. You know because for better or for worse, different teams own different systems. And, and so to get this to work, you have to be making sure everyone's on the same page. So I'm curious who's at the table in these discussions. And maybe I'll start with uh, uh, Gwen this time and then go to Jesse, but you know, who who's even in the conversations when you start to talk about having one system talk to the other? Well, I'm, I'm chuckling because you said team and here at the State Museum, I think it's teams, <laughs> plural. Um, <laughs> just because we sure. are a state bureaucracy um, and there are so many different people, departments and entities even within our one building. Um, and we have recently uh, hired a new database manager. And so I'm very excited about the direction that we're gonna take because he's really proving to be a central person and bringing us together without him. There's a real tendency here to be siloed and not talk to each other. Um, and so I'm really looking to him to bring in our IT people and um, our database management folks and to really bring the curators, the collection managers and um, all of us together really, because I think intentionally we're on the same page. We're a state institution. We want to make our our collections accessible to the public because that is our mission to provide and promote the education of all of our visitors, New Yorkers or folks outside of New York. Um, so I think in the future, we're gonna be bringing everyone to the table. I think, you know, it's been a little rocky uh, <laughs> in the past, but we have a number of people that are part of our team from our, conserver our conservator on staff to our archivist and our curators. Oh, that's great. How about you, Jesse? Yeah, I, I would echo Gwen and say we have teams for days. Um, we have a technical <laughs> team, we have um, end user representative teams, we have a cataloging team, we have um, a uh, prioritization and workflow team, we have a communication and training team. Yeah, nothing, lot, lots of teams. We have, you know, our vendor support team. Um, so there's so many teams doing so many different things throughout the institution. But I think, um, you know, having, bringing all of these people to the table really allows us to do um, interesting new things and integrate in a way that we couldn't have imagined um, previous to having a digital asset management system. Um, you know, to Kara's point, something that we've done is by bringing say our our marketing folks who take photographs you know like nice glossy photographs that are featured on the website or of events together 
with our historical collections folks is we have people on the historical collection side actually tagging those glossy photos with accession numbers. And so now if somebody asks them, hey, what's that, what's that thing that's just decoratively lying on a table? Well, we can tell them that's this person's paper and it's about this story. And so we can start to integrate those workflows together by bringing all of these people together in a centralized system. That's great. And John and Kara, in your experience, you know, who, what are the roles that need to be at the table here? You know, are there, are there kind of, kind of surprising roles that, that your projects, you know, have seen success with it if, if certain people are at the table? You know, the one that I'm thinking of that pops in my head is that is always maybe thought of at the, at the last, sometimes legal needs to be at the table, right? You're, 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 uh, you know, and, and sometimes that's like an afterthought, but sometimes it, it, it works better if, if, if they're at the table in the beginning. But, you know, it's something that's not always thought of. But what other roles should be should be considered? Well, I'll, I'll just jump in. But I, yeah. I mean, exactly what Gwen and Jesse just said. I, I mean, of course, the technology folks are going to be really important. And that might be your in-house, but it might be your external partners as well. Um, and a lot of times your damn vendor needs to be very much in this conversation, but also, you know, making sure you understand the, what their role is going to be for any integrations versus what are you going to be responsible for in the institution or what are you going to need additional support for? So sometimes you might have a few different vendors um, at, at the table as well. So, so that's kind of your external stakeholders, but then of course you have your internal. So anyone who's going to be um, who has some decision-making authority on um, those other systems that are in the mix in that ecosystem. But also I think something that's often um, overlooked is just kind of a higher level strategy. Um, and you know, what is this um, system fulfilling for our institution? What problem does it solve? What opportunities does it bring? And kind of guiding that vision so that the, the integrations are really um, strategically considered and um, and are carefully done because I think sometimes it can get just it feels urgent to integrate everything but integrating everything is actually very difficult so so doing it carefully and thoughtfully and um, so a leader who can help with that guide that conversation is always very helpful to have at the table. Yeah, I I would add to that. Um, I think that legal is definitely. Um, someone that should be referenced from periodically and should be part of the team. Um, kind of one of the things I come from an operations background, and back in the old days, before everything was digital, it uh, you know legal was like the people who told you no, right? That's that was their primary role. And what's really been surprising, and I'd say in the last three or four years, that I've interacted with some uh, legal teams, particularly around things like GDPR and. Um, some of the more global standards and copyright and stuff. The legal team has actually been big supporters because now the dam with through metadata and rules, you give them the tools so they can set the, the rules to impose across the platform and it makes their life easier. So they're, you know, I found them recently, uh, every time I've talked to anyone from a legal or regulatory side of uh, any institution to be pretty reasonable because now we're telling them how we can help them versus in the old days where they were telling us, don't do that, don't do these, these kind of things. The other thing I think is really important, um, you know, we touch on strategy. Uh, I find I get in conversations where we're talking about the dam and the assets and all the different possibilities for integration. Then you learn that there's a small team it's, it's rolling out of CMS and they've made that decision to go totally around the dam because they view themselves as special or transactional or whatever. Even though you have all the tools they need and they're essentially rebuying, you know, because they're not in the conversation, they don't understand, you know, how far things have come really, I think in the last three to five years. And so just keeping up, you know, the, the stakeholder community on what you can do because, you know, every Every piece of software out there, right, is going through some major feature upgrade probably once a year on average. So I think that's a hard that's a hard task for all of us is that outreach, which um, I still struggle with, you know, because you don't know who you don't know. Sure, sure, sure. And 
one thing I'll add, just I'll make it my, my plea to everyone, you know, whether they're on this call or, you know, down the uh, on, a, on a current dam project or down the road, I would encourage all of you to have someone who's thinking about the user experience of the people using these systems whenever you do an integration, right? Because whenever you do an integration, you're fundamentally impacting the way your colleagues are going to work. Right, whether it's data coming from one to another system, they have to do something with that or make sense of the assets moving from a system to system. It, it's fundamentally changing the way you work. So you need someone who's, it might not be a full-time person who's, who's solely fo focused on it, but someone needs to be thinking about the cohesive experiences that you're creating. And, and, and hopefully by integrating, you're helping people do their job, not hindering what they're, what they're doing. So that's always a, a, a key consideration here. To that point, you know, where we talk about technical technical uh, integrations, we talk about user experience considerations, but the secret sauce here that we all know is the in order for integrations to work, the multiple systems have to be speaking the same language. And, and that's making sure that we have consistent metadata, consistent taxonomy, so that what we're calling one, something in one system lines up to what we're calling something in, in another system. So how do we make sure that we have the right metadata in place, the right, right taxonomies in place. And, and, and Jesse and Gwen, I'll start with you again. You know, how, who's in your, uh, in your organization, who's responsible for thinking about the metadata? You know, is it, is it, a, is it a single role? Is it multiple people? Who's, who's really owning, owning the, the language these systems are speaking? Jesse, you want to go first this time? Sure. Um, I think my clarifying question to you is, are you talking about, say, the descriptive metadata, the administrative metadata? What type of what type of metadata are we talking? Yeah, I mean, it, it could be it could be a multitude of things, but but if you think about, you know, if you in your example, you know, your preservation system is is talking to your dam, right? And and, and so if you're talking about a, a particular uh, object in your collection, you're going to make sure that you're referencing it in the same way, right? They can't be calling it two completely different mm -hmm. things, right? So. Uh, so I, I would ask you, who's who's making sure that there's some commonality there between those those two systems? Sure. Yeah. So in our environment, we rely heavily on unique identifiers um, okay. to yep. integrate all of these systems together. In some cases, that could be you know an accession number. We have record grid numbers that get applied, photograph numbers. Um, but there's always some sort of unique identifier that you know, in theory, is stable and permanent. And so we rely on that pretty heavily to, um, you know, move content around to integrate it together. We also, um, almost all of our systems um, end up getting consolidated into a solar index, which is used to power our online catalog collection search. So that solar catalog is actually the place that um, data from the dams gets dropped into. Um, that uh, the preservation system picks data up from based on pattern matching with that unique identifier. So for us, you know, that identifier associated with either that collection or that image is just, it's key. And every, if that identifier for whatever reason changes, we need to know about it ASAP because everything breaks. <laughs> We, we too um, also rely on a unique identifier, a catalog number in our case. And I will say that the um, collections have gone through some changes in how they catalog things. So uh, <laughs> we actually still rely on a hard copy <laughs> inventory every once in a while when something doesn't add up. Um, but in terms of who is at the table in terms of metadata, um, you know, uh, one of the questions that I've really had for my work curating this collection is how to bring in and really include Haudenosaunee people who have quite a bit to say about the objects that are part of their uh, ancestors' histories and their histories as well, and even their creative um, generative making today. And so what we've kind of my um, assistant and I have been working on in our department is really thinking through kind of some of the steps that we can take on the front end to make um, it more accessible online and physically for Haudenosaunee folks to work with us on um, augmenting our, our metadata and adding to our records because we recognize that we um, really 
uh, are not the authoritative source for um, certain types of information that are related to our objects. And so we're really moving forward with this idea of um, sharing authority with communities um, outside of our museum. And I find that really exciting. So metadata, Karen, John, what other considerations should people be thinking about when when you're looking to get your metadata house in order, you know, so that to, to help ease the these integrations that we're talking about? John, do you um, want to take this one? Sure. Well, yeah, I I get in these conversations only a couple times a day. Um, <laughs> one thing I deal with is divestitures and uh, it, you know, because of that, I get to look at metadata over time. And I think that's one of the interesting things I think the museum community does better than anyone else is you guys pick a system and tend to stick with it over a long period of time. Commercial world, things change. You know, you th think about the products you had at your table when you were a kid and what you have at your table now, right? They may be the same, but they've probably gone through a lot of relabeling. Um, think about UPC codes, things like that. So the real world is just kind of like a uh, ocean with tides and numbering and metadata systems is always changing. Um, I really like the idea of, of being able to um, have systems I can trust. And one of the things that I'm starting to come back around to, I was on this 10 years ago, but now I'm starting to do it again, is embedding unique identifiers in the metadata headers of assets. Because um, I think that's something that we've kind of, I mean, in our side of the business, we've lost sight of that. And being able to, to tie things back to their origin continues to be a problem a lot of times. I spend a lot of time trying to explain to people either where it came from or why I don't know. Yeah, I'll hop, hop onto that. I, I, I think that's a, that is a really great approach. And if you can make it work to have those embedded identifiers travel, because that's where things tend to get lost as they move away from the, the, the system of origin. Um, so I think there's interesting ways to do that. Um, you know, maybe, but there's increasingly more and more interesting ways that these things can be done using blockchain technologies and things like that. So we're, we're starting to kind of see some interesting opportunities there. But at the end of the day, it also comes back to kind of data governance in a lot of ways. You know, what what is, um, um, you know, there are probably people who make decisions about data and which data is the, what's the system of record for which pieces of data. Um, and the dam is probably the authoritative record for the assets, but it may not be the authoritative record for the title of that work. And that's probably the collections management system. And then, you know, there's probably some other piece of information that's also coming from a different place. So getting clear on which system is the system of record for which pieces of data, and you really have to break it apart to understand, you know, what the, the totality of the metadata is kind of, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a blob of different pieces that come together from different places. Um, and so, you know, and then when you do the integration, figuring out what are the business rules and business logic for those relationships between the systems where if the collections management system is the authority for the object title or object description, but the dam already has a description in that field, what should be the behavior? Um, you know, because this, the, you know, the system of record is now telling it to change, you know, so thinking about the pieces on that level and then what those behaviors are um, is, is important. And, and then sometimes what we see is not that the systems of record are, you know, the various systems that talk to each other, but there's a some third uh, party system or an additional system that's like the metadata or taxonomy management system, um, which, you know, and that's kind of also into the mix. We didn't even talk about that as part of the integration ecosystem, but um, yeah, there's often kind of descriptive, um, uh, you know, metadata or, or taxonomy, uh, control vocabulary, authoritative um, descriptive systems. And sometimes those are external to the organization, um, like Library of Congress subject headings, for example, or, or, you know, various name authorities, but sometimes they're internal. So there's a lot to tease out when you start getting into, like, how do you actually keep the metadata in sync? But anyway, just 
I wanted to add a few more thoughts. No, that's great. And unfortunately, we only have one minute left, so I'm not gonna. <laughs> I don't think we have a time to take a take a full question here. But there's, you know, there's a lot of great questions here that uh, I know the the team will, will get access to, and and you can uh, follow up with them them separately. There's a lot of questions around, you know, uh, how do you make the tough decisions around what what system should be that uh, that system of record right and especially when there's overlap like your i imagine jesse in your world there's some overlap between your digital preservation system and your dam and, and, and you have to make some decisions at the end of the day which one flows from which system to the other and which one is the is the, is the true system of record so we're not gonna have time to solve that in the next minute but I think uh, I just wanted to thank all of you for your, your sharing your experiences and expertise today. I think it's been really, really interesting. I know, I hope, I hope everyone can grasp that integrations is not just something you just check the box and, and are done with it, right? It's not just a technical thing. It's not just, do we have an API and we're, yes, check. We're 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 all we're all set. It's much more nuanced than that. It's a technical problem. It's a metadata problem. It's a um, uh, a resource problem. It's a team problem. It's an internal process problem. You know, everyone, all these things have to be involved to get this right. And and that, as I said earlier, it's a user it's a user experience challenge at the end of the day too, because we're creating experiences for your team to ultimately create other experiences for your your museum uh, visitors as well. So again. Thank you all so much for your, your contributions. I, I appreciate it very much. Um, I encourage you to check out those questions and, and everyone feel free to reach out to this, this great group of, of uh, consultants and practitioners. I'm sure they'd be glad to touch base offline. Thank you all so much for joining the session today and enjoy the rest of the show.